Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl. I'm your guide through these uh, hour shows about issues of interest uh, to and about the LBGT community. And today I've got a great guest for you, Tom Amiano, who is currently a supervisor in the city and county of San Francisco, longtime activist, and, you know, like all of us, uh, about a hundred other things in his <laughs> life. So welcome, Tom. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is one in a series of shows that I've done uh, where I like to just one-on-one -on -one interview somebody about kind of about their life you know sure. we kind of see people the way they are at the moment and get kind of a snapshot I don't want a snapshot I want a movie okay kind of, you know yeah so starting at the beginning uh, where'd you grow up and what was it like the wonderful garden state of uh, New Jersey <laughs> uh, interestingly you know uh, as we're filming this Ken Burns is uh, uh, epic is on TV and it, it did right. bring back some memories because I was born in the 40s uh -huh. in Newark, New Jersey and uh, even though I was only four or five when the war was happening distinctly remembered my uncle Frankie uh, coming back from the war flinging open the door putting his duffel bag down and saying mm -hmm. I'm home and my mother dropping the pot of spaghetti and screaming <laughs> Uh, it was spaghetti, let he, me see. Does that mean you came from an Italian think, yeah, family? Because, yeah, there was no uh, 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 Chef Boyardee for us, you know, <laughs> this was all from scratch. Uh, it, it was a nice, uh, growing up in that, it was, a, it was a poor neighborhood, but everybody kind of looked out for each other. They called it Down Neck, which I think was the configuration of a, a part, a little isthmus in Newark. And then we moved to a, another town. But I do remember people yelling at the, out, out the window, Frankie, get in here before I kick your butt. You know, or, or somebody squealing on me, you know, to my mother. Uh huh. Uh, so, and uh, but economically, there was a lot of stresses. My father drove a cab. Uh, for many years, and um, people often say, and they probably say this to you too, what's your interest in health care? You know, mm -hmm. well, duh. Yeah. On, but like you had it. Yeah, that's right. And um, I remember when my father died, there was like absolutely nothing. And uh, my poor mother, um, she went down there and she ran it and raved to the owners of the taxi company, and we didn't know any better. We were kind of embarrassed, uh -huh. you know, that she did uh -huh. that. But of course, in retrospect, Ma, you were right. Yeah. Her anger was totally so we ha we practiced this uh, there was no money even for a burial so mm -hmm. we practiced this thing the Italians called the labust so you come to the funeral home and you got a user-friendly funeral director and people would sign a book I remember uh, guys with gold in their teeth and coming you know and with the cigar smoke signing and then they would one hundred dollars or ten dollars and that paid that pay for the burial and pay for the funeral. And uh, I think my mother got a little kitchen set out of what was left over. Sure. Of uh, but those are the memories you don't lose. And then, the, you know, the uh, politics, as I always say, politics is personal. Sure. So even unconsciously, you know, working on healthcare was something that, you know, you and I both wanted to do for, for reasons. Well, I think it's even like more that. personal in a way, in ter just in terms of how you feel about the rest of the world. Yeah. You know, do you want to help the rest of the world? Or do you feel like, well, nobody helped me so I'm not going to help anybody. Yeah. And, yeah, and you know, sometimes it can be the same upbringing. It, so I don't know, you know how it, where the variation comes in. Yeah. You know, I had the Catholic school thing happening. You went uh, to Catholic school? Yeah, you know, the, uh, yeah and the, you know, it was very repressive. And, the, you know, you always had that outsider feeling because I knew I was gay. You know, there's no, like, epiphany when I was 35 or at 60 looking at my two kids and saying, why? I, why? I mean, I knew. And I think everybody else knew, too, which was a little difficult with the running away and... Um, Running never, away you, from school? Oh, the bull, the bullies, uh, etc. Oh, yeah. yeah, I always had my mouth, though. You know what I mean? To f that's how I fought back. But yeah. every, everything happened. That, and I think the terrible thing for a lot of us was, we you know, you couldn't tell your family because you were ashamed. You right. know. Right. But I always liked friends. I was always very social. And the one thing the Catholic schools did do for me is the. Uh, uh, that sense of community. Right. So you knew right away when uh, when something was unjust. Maybe you didn't know the concept, but you knew it was wrong for my mother to be fired from the phone company. She was a little um, cafeteria worker. Hi, my name is Susie, which uh -huh. wasn't her name. Her name was Vincenza, but you know. <laughs> right, but, but who can say Vincenza? She was let go because cosmetically her teeth looked bad, but they had, of course, they had no health benefits. They had no dental benefits. And she they was, never why made was she the let connection. go? Because, you know, they just said you have bad teeth. And so it's oh. not attractive you know if you work in a cafeteria did and you course, have uh, siblings yeah I have um, an older sister 
uh, and an older brother and then a younger sister. Uh, my older brother and sister are both in their 70s uh, and they're very New Jersey and they're very supportive uh -huh. and then my younger sister uh, as well and she's the one who said you got to say hello to Zelda because <laughs> she's the total TV <laughs> You know, she she's it's in her fifties, but she remembers everything. You well, know. you know, they reran those shows. Yeah, so that, everybody. Yeah. I always say to people, clearly, you're not old enough to have seen them. You know, <laughs> in the original. So that's sort of my standard line. Yeah. So you went to all through high school in uh, in New Jersey. Yeah, Immaculate Conception. Lots of jokes about that. I had a lot of material when I did stand up. You know, on based we'll on. We'll get to your on, being the, a on the background, and then I got I, I was uh, got a scholarship to uh, all boys. Catholic University, Seton Hall uh -huh. University. It was a day hop school. It was very, very uh, kind of industrial academic. I mean, we actually had a voice and diction class uh, the first year because people, my friend, we they, we said Woim and Boyd and you no, know, you weren't making that up, you know. So it was like a blackboard jungle, but it was supposed to be college, uh, you know. But the uh, the calibration wasn't quite. This was not Yale, Harvard, or, uh -huh. or you know. And there were priests there, and obviously there were some who were very, very effeminate and people made jokes about them. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a divinity school there which we called Sally's Alley. So it wasn't like <laughs> gay stuff wasn't on people's mind. It certainly was on mine. I mean, it's an all boys school. Right. And uh, they always told you, you know, you were going to go to hell if you didn't do this or didn't do that. So actually, you know, Catholics, we have the confession, like you can expiate it. So I actually went to confession. I actually said, oh, I like boys to the priest. I thought the lightning bolt was going to come down. Mm -hmm. And so he gave, of course, the generic advice. Well, put that out of your mind, find a nice young woman who will then become psychotic, marry her, <laughs> and have kids. If you don't we, become psychotic yeah, first. You don't. <laughs> right. So I, I said, okay, that's my resolve. And I walked out, and a guy walked by me in this all milk, and he had just the nicest butt I had ever seen. And I, I knew right then, forget that, Father. Forget the effect. Yeah. Three more Hail Marys, um, it'll be fine. <laughs> So that was my, you know, the opinion. So the, after that, it was how do I deal with this and how do I get out of here? Uh, get out of here. Out uh, of New Jersey, yeah. out of the Catholic so milieu. So was there anything that happened to you in college, though, that gave you sort of a thought, gee, I'd like to do that when I get out of school or something? Well, the scholarship like a a, 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 allowed me to have a little slack on working in the summer, uh -huh. you know, because since the tuition was paid for. And uh, I fell into this um, uh, uh, area of I worked at camps for the handicapped uh -huh. and uh, it doesn't sound like much but I left that little block in New Jersey and I went to the Catskills and it was called Camp Jeanette and the uh, campers were all disabled either in, uh, in chairs or or uh, you know had muscular dystrophy or or what what have you but the other counselors were from New York or occasionally from uh, maybe England and it just opened up everything it, it, it wasn't even that I had to go to the Antarctic. To, the, right. It was it was great, and they didn't judge me as much as I was judged in Jersey uh -huh. about being you know a little Nelly and uh -huh. a little fast talking, and it just was wonderful. And I knew that I would have to do something similar the rest of my life, even though I knew my family wouldn't understand. So I thought maybe I would get involved in working with with the handicap, uh -huh. and that took me to California. How was that? There was a Camp Easter Seal out there, and the guy who I worked with in New York State said, "Why don't you all come out?" Huh. And I said, wow, what, a, what an opportunity. It was, you know, only 19 or 20. Had you been to California before? No, I never thought. <laughs> it was like, you know, oh, my, going to pa paradise. And I, I took the Greyhound bus. And, you know, uh, Italians, you know, they're very family oriented. So my mother felt like I was leaving forever. She put on a black dress. I can, and she waved from the porch because the, <laughs> the Greyhound bus stopped right at the corner. <laughs> and it was three and a half days. I think it cost 40 bucks to do that in those days. And... Um, uh, so all by yourself, not with a friend. No, no. And uh, so I bet you talked to everybody on the bus. Well, yes. Yeah, so I was very shy, really, really painfully shy. And we, we, the bus broke down in Iowa. You know, one of those long square states, and it was 90 degrees. And uh, one of the people I came across uh, after I said hi and everything, he asked me what country I was from. You know, it was <laughs> <laughs> but I landed in in uh, in San Francisco at the Greyhound bus depot. Wow. Which is big in gay lore. You know, gay male lore for a long. And immediately got cruised, and you know, knew something was. <laughs> so different. I went. I I came back and finished uh, my degree, and then I joined the Peace Corps. He so always this thing to move to get out, get out. But having no money, 
trying to figure out. What, what got you thinking about joining the Peace Corps? Well, idealism, it was Kennedy years, it was uh -huh. very romantic, uh, and it was also an out that could be paid for. Right. And uh, they sent me to Indiana to train to go to Thailand. Um, but I can see the connection. Yeah, well, this is good. Go to, what I, you know, I pronounce it Thailand. This is, I did until I learned better. Uh, and here I am in the Midwest, and everybody is very white, and certainly not Italian. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of class issues that, uh, if, if I didn't know them before, the other candidates for Thailand really did have more upper class backgrounds. See, this mm -hmm. was more of a, when you think of it, more of a leisure thing, you know. Uh, uh, to go into the Yeah, beach yeah. and um, I didn't, so you got deselected. It was like this horrible word. It's bad enough I'm struggling with who I am. You got deselected. Well, they said, oh, it's because you have asthma. But you know, I knew it was because I was different, whatever the difference was going to be. And uh, so rather than go back to uh, Newark, which would have been profoundly depressing, uh -huh. I hopped on yet another Greyhound. Greyhound is the motif so now. So you, you joined the Peace Corps, but they didn't send you to a foreign right. country. I got they deselected. deselected. Big D. That must have been a real kind of wrenching thing. It was a downer, man. I just felt, I mean, I cried my eyes out. And I thought, I have no alternatives. I'm not going back to Newark. Right. I will die. And of course, the family doesn't understand that right. at the time. So I came back to California. Huh. And that's and then started at uh, had a variety of jobs, and uh, lived in San Francisco. That was about sixty two, sixty three, and um, went to San Francisco State uh -huh. and got a master's in special ed. Uh huh. And um, th uh, thought that I would start my teaching career after I did something. And so then I found something else to do that would take me out of the country, and it was called International Voluntary Services. God loved them, IVS. It was a, a, a private Peace Corps. The Peace Corps was actually modeled on this, uh -huh. but the people came from all over the world rather than just America. And it was Quaker-based, and it was in of all places, Vietnam and Laos, and the Vietnam War was becoming very, very prominent, right. the 66. And uh, I think they were really desperate. You know, one time I actually read the interview of me uh -huh. uh, where the guy said was, he was a strange little fellow. <laughs> That was his assessment of you. Who couldn't sit down. <laughs> I don't, I forget, and other, other little things that could be very telling. Uh, I don't know if he was doing it naively or not, but he, he, I think because nobody wanted to volunteer to go to Vietnam. Right. So I got selected, and so that opened up a whole new world. I was there for two years. Where were you in Vietnam? Uh, I was uh, in a small town called Ninh Hoa, mm -hmm. uh, and then I was in a, a bigger town called Nha Trang. So what part of Vietnam was that? It's uh, central. Uh -huh. And I mean, we spent time in Saigon as well. And uh -huh. um, I got very politicized. I mean, I really saw it was a civil war, you know, and uh, never didn't hang out much with the army. Uh, there was a big gay scene there that I kind of fell into. Uh -huh. you, you know, uh, the Vietnamese, my Vietnamese friends said, oh, there's no homosexuality in Vietnam. The like French, in Iran. I the, heard it announced yeah, the other yeah. day. <laughs> The Absolutely French brought assured. it. The French, French brought, brought it. Right. <laughs> I said, well, they must have been in Newark because <laughs> I don't know where I got it. Um, uh, and so I came back from Vietnam after, after you know, the famous Tet. All that That's happened right, while I was there. I, you know, it's like Pee Wee's big adventure in some ways, and I have a lot of white guilt about it because my Vietnamese friends could, were suffering, uh, and I could always leave. Right. And you know, uh, in fact, IVS got very politicized because a lot of conscientious objectors mm -hmm. joined IVS, um, uh, hoping that perhaps they wouldn't have to be drafted. I was already 4F for, uh, you know, asthma and things like that. It was easy uh, to be what they called 4F. Uh, if uh, you, because uh, Vietnam wasn't prominent yet, it was on the back. Kennedy right. was still alive, right? You know, and uh, you know, let's face it, a lot of African Americans, a lot of Latin, they got drafted That's who first. Went. Yeah, yeah. I was there in '69 with the USO. Oh my god! I mean, gosh. it's sort of at the height of one of the heights yeah. of the war. Yeah. So you're certainly absolutely right about who was there. And of course they accepted every exempted everybody who was in college. Yeah. And that drew the line right there. And as then well. you became one A or something and you know people right. would uh, and uh, I think Kennedy, while while he was still alive, obviously passed it. If you were married, you wouldn't be drafted. Everything was starting to diminish, right. and then boom, you know, uh, it blossomed into what we know as the tragedy of Vietnam. So, what happened after you came back? Um, I certainly said I was not going to live in New Jersey. So, so you had your masters, but you had gone 
said to the Peace Corps, all right, don't take me, I'll go here. Yeah, and that yeah. was good. Yeah, I that mean, was good. I mean, I was lucky. You know, it was a, 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 that terrible fluorescent lighting in state colleges. You know, was that, yeah, it was at uh, San Francisco State. And it's, you know, 9 o'clock, and I'm looking, there's that little brochure. Would you like to go to Vietnam? <laughs> Only I would have, you know, been driven to it. So I came back, and I uh, started to uh, teach. And I got, you know, uh, San Francisco in that time, was, and of course the, the West Coast was just on fire with the civil rights movement and the feminist movement, and God, the gay movement, oh yeah. You know, so, and San Francisco was a great place to be for that. And I kept my ties to my Vietnamese friends. There was a program where, um, you know, kids who had been wounded could work, and my Vietnamese was terrible, but, you know, it had a big New Jersey inflection on it. Uh, so it was wonderful, you know, I, and you had energy. I, I could teach in the day, uh, be active at night uh, at the discos, and then also be politically active. That's when I met Harvey Milk, or knew of Harvey Milk. Uh -huh. You know, the Castro was also on fire in a whole different way, flaming, right. I should say, you know. Well, but it's, it's interesting, too, because this is pre-AIDS, right? Oh, yeah, there was no thought. Uh, th there was a, a venereal disease every so often, and it would be a joke, and you'd go to the so clinic. So when you say politically active, uh, sort of what was that like or about? Uh, well, it was it, w it was uh, very heady because you're still a little intimidated. You know, you're a public school teacher. Sure. But, you know, you saw these things that were not great in the gay community. You saw uh, the bars really discreet. You know, they used to have this silly thing, no shoes, no open shoes, no hats. No, something else. One was against blacks. I mean, the connections were mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. weird. One was against women. Uh, and then if you didn't look right, they'd ask for three picture IDs. You know, this, I knew that wasn't right. And uh, so I found out about an organization called BAGEL, Bay Area Gay Liberation. Huh. And it was very left oriented. I mean, to the point of, you know, some of them like Stalin and some of them like Trotsky, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, what, what can I tell you? I, I like the, the woman, you know, that was so involved. Uh, I'm having a senior moment here, but I'll, I'll think of her name. I'll have it with you. Yeah. Um, and I liked it. I liked the idea they would pick it. You know, it was a lot of street action. Uh, it appealed to my sense, of, a new sense of affirmation. Uh -huh. And then uh, I, we started something called the Gay Teachers Coalition, and there was three of us. <laughs> Uh, we made it like there was millions, and uh, uh, that's when you really came up against the closet thing too, because there are a lot of closeted gay teachers who did not like you, who right. didn't want you to do it. We tried to have a speakers bureau in the public schools; they would subvert that. I mean, it was, it, but but did didn't you, matter. you didn't feel like your work was at risk or your job was at risk? I did, but I I was kind of like I dare you. Yeah. So after I taught at this school for about six years, we actually had a press. I, I was so, I didn't even know have a press conference. I called this African American woman I knew, who with the black teachers had. I said. Vivan, Ivan, how do I do a press conference? She said, well, you do who, what, and where. And so we had mimeographs in those days. Right, you know, nah, sure. Who was in the ink was smudged. No, that's how we got high before drugs. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> that, that, thank you, Sheila. That's why I taught school. Uh, and we had our first, so I was on the front page of the San Francisco Examiner, gay, gifted, and closeted. And I looked like Abby Hoffman, and you know, I had a perm, and I had the beard. Um, and everyone thought, oh, you know, the school district. They didn't do anything. You know, in fact, parents came up and said, oh, you taught my uh, son in the third grade, and you're wonderful. And a lot of the Latino parents cut the picture out, put it on the refrigerator. I'm not even saying they're, they're that sophisticated, or that there was in home if there was still a lot in the teacher's room particularly sure. but I, I, I tired of the double thing you know and it was also so obvious that that, that I was gay it's so. freeing I mean it was even the best when thing everyone ever in the whole world says you know when are they actually gonna like tell us yeah still when you you know coming out it's so freeing because then what can they do to you that's it you know uh, I kept looking over my shoulder yeah. for a while you know but sure. uh, it, it was it was it was great, and then uh, you so know, what years are we talking about here? Well, that, that would be uh, 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 early '70s up uh -huh. to up to '75 uh -huh. when we had this big gay teacher action in San Francisco. And what was action, that? we picketed the school board so that they would um, include uh, sexual orientation in their discrimination clause, and that uh, I, I could advertise the meetings in their little funky newsletter, which their lawyer, you had to remember the 70s, said how we couldn't do that. Right, and, right. Uh, they did a complete turnaround, and then Briggs happened, you know, the anti. It was funny that we had we, done that in We actually 75. have some viewers in other states, so we should probably talk about yeah. what Briggs was. What, I, an odd little guy who was <laughs> in the state legislator. Right. Later. 
and decided to take on gays in teaching and that if you were a gay you should be fired or found out to be see that was found out to be so it's all that chilling right and it became a statewide a battle. I forget it was Prop Six. Uh -huh. um, we didn't know who our friends were going to be. Uh, now, did he get that through the legislature to put it on the ballot, or did they get signatures? Six. He got six. Yeah, you because, know, because uh, very not every state has initiative. The initiative yeah, process. Yeah. Mostly the western states. That's have right. It. So uh, it it turned out to be a great mobilizing too. We didn't think so. The poll initial polls were horrible. And, uh, so the initiative would have said, if you're gay, you can be fired, no problem, out. if you're a teacher. Yeah. Because we don't want those gay people. You know, teachers. my joke was, show me a room full of teachers, I'll show you a gay bar. You know, everybody knew. Right. And then even the fight taught me some things, because it's like, well, you know, I'm out, I'm a teacher, let me, I can, I can do whatever you want me to do. Some of the gay establishment you know, types were nervous about someone like me because I was not a good, I was too Nelly, I was too whatever. Mm -hmm. And you know, they would desperately try to find a gay teacher who was out and they, the poor guy maybe was out, maybe wasn't. Uh -huh. You know, uh, Harvey Milk was very, very um, articulate on this issue along with uh, Sally Gearhart you, and brought uh, uh, national attention to this issue and, and how they presented it. Uh, you can see a little bit of that in the Harvey Milk movie. Uh -huh. uh, and then people started to come out of the woodwork about well you know we already have a law that says if you're uh, inappropriate you heterosexuals actually have the highest uh, amount of of molestation which you know was horrible to think that you would be you right know, but you freedom. always have to you always have to say these things if you don't you know because of yeah. the stereotypes and because yeah. of the assumptions that people make and then people especially say, in a statewide election well where, you, you know, know you I have had to no keep idea. people from voting for a bad thing you know and what would the valley do and you know uh, who was going to go door to door i was really nervous about going door to door sure uh, but then even uh, the uh, wilson riles the state uh, uh, superintendent, superintendent of came out against it and then uh, 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 i think ronald reagan was uh, yeah, governor. Yeah, and so Jimmy Carter came out for a um, a big rally for him, and you could actually see it on the film. Yeah, California, blah blah blah. And then somebody whispered something to him. And he went, "Oh yeah, and no on six. Well, we went. Ah! I mean, it was such a vindication <laughs> that somebody like uh, the president would. Uh, there's that story in the Harvey Milk film. You know, uh, Harvey met. Um, uh, the sister who was the evangel evangelical, uh -huh. and uh, and I don't think she wanted to shake his hand. And Harvey said because she didn't know where I was, you know, where I got <laughs> ended up. So that was a two to one, was uh, defeated Prop Six. So it was that was a big it was a big it? victory. Yeah. But I remember the time very well actually, and you know, and it happened still, because every year, including this year, there's always something on the ballot about us, something to keep us from doing this. In those years, it was teaching, and these years, it's marriage. You know, but always something to sort of to limit the community. Trans or, and or we worry trannies. every yes, and and look at the argument in the federal government yeah. about whether you know a non-discrimination bill should include transgender yeah. people. When yeah. in California, we put it all in the same law. I know it. I know it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, you know, you, you get no, an opportunity no, no, to do good in these you, things. You. Uh, you um, Oftentimes have pushed the envelope up there. I just think it's it's, it's well, quite wonderful. Well, you're going to have your turn. Yes, yeah. Tom, yeah, we're no, looking forward yeah, to it. Yeah, me too. So uh, let's see. You're in San Francisco. We've now had the Briggs Initiative defeated. Uh, are you, and you're still teaching? What I'm were you teaching, teaching, but I'm restless. I took mostly special ed. Uh huh. Um, and I like teaching, and you know the other teachers like me, and the kids like me, and uh, but I'm much too restless. And uh, you know, I think that with the affirmation, you know, I always say to people, uh, and I know that you've been very, very good about this. It's like, yeah, yeah, there, there's a genital expression, and there's a gender identity, and there's anatomy. But you know what? We got a culture, boys and girls, and it, they, there is a queer culture, and it's about sensibilities and how you see the world. And it's fine. It's nothing to apologize for. In fact, it enriches. Right. It's you like know? diversity. Yeah, hello. So um, in San Francisco, you know, you start to see gay artists and photographers and, you know, uh, women poets. And well, and I thought, what, what is my thing? I like to make people laugh. I like always wanted to be a performer, but afraid to. You know, people would make fun. And uh, so I started to do stand-up comedy. Uh, as, I, as I was teaching, you know, at night, um, it was pretty gruesome. Uh, uh, San Francisco in those days had a big comedy Empire. Mm -hmm. There's Robin Williams, blah, blah, blah. But when you went to the open mics, people would make fag jokes 
but here was a fag making the jokes mm -hmm. and people would throw things at you and the other comics were AHs, if I can say it, you know, and I thought we really need a place to do something and um, that's the Valencia Rose, which started a, in an old funeral home on Valencia Street in San Francisco. <laughs> Ron Lanza, God love him, he just, he's somebody I knew from Bagel. I said, well, what do you want to do with this now? He, and he goes, well, I'm going to have cabaret. This was his little dream, you know, it was the uh -huh. Mickey Rooney thing. Hey, kids. Let's, let's do a show in the He garage. said, I've always wanted to do right. that. And I said, well, could we do gay comedy there? He said, great. What's gay comedy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but we'll find we'll out. We'll find out. Right. So we started, and it was people like Leah Delaria and, and Marga Gomez and Danny Williams. We didn't even have a microphone. I didn't even learn mic technique until <laughs> <laughs> we had enough people come in and start to pay. So how do you start being a, a stand-up? comic though I mean you say to your friend give me 10 minutes I'll give you I'll, I'll yeah. just do this yeah we just we we, we, we winged it wow. and, and people you know fr initially friends would come but then the word would spread I mean I knew about the art form of comedy I mean you know and you kind of have it um, an int intuition for it but the craft of it I didn't know you know uh, and I like writing mm -hmm. so and I like politics and you know Reagan and those people were very rich and, and Bush of course now and so and then gay oppression you know you could turn it around and if you're affirmed then the audience and there were gay people didn't like it because they said oh no you're letting people know what am I letting people know? You know that we're screwed up, but we, you know that we're dying, but we're we're happy to. I don't know. What are we letting people know? Um, but it was very, very uh, edifying for me, and pretty, pretty scary. Sure. At times, and uh, I had was in a relationship uh, then with uh, Tim Kerbo, who has left us, and he was a teacher as well. And God, that poor guy. I would bring him to these hot, you know, Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, comedy nights, you know, and <laughs> the waitress with the big hair, and they thought he was a big, handsome Tex, Texas, and he'd sit there, and they'd be coming on to him, and he goes, this is not worth it. And no, one, no, I'm with him. Yeah, yeah it didn't matter. And, and then uh, it was at the time of heavy drug use in these clubs, and, the, you know, the Quaalude crowd, and, you know, they would get really threatening, and, and I saw Tim suffer so much because of me. I said, you know what? You never have to come with me again. I, I didn't understand until I really saw him get up. Well, he's worried about me. Sure, you know. of course. Uh, so he, he was very vulnerable up on the stage. Oh like man, I'll tell you. Uh, but it was great. To, to, I'll never, I'll never regret doing it. I just didn't want to be like the oldest gay comic, you know, going to uh, laughs a lot in Walnut Creek. You know, sure. It's very hard to make a career, as you know. It's you know, uh, for women, uh, for gays, in comedy particularly, you know, it's very cutthroat. Um, closet mentality would just try to cut you off. I mean, here be the biggest queen saying, "You can't play my club." There's a, a, one of the worst reasons was because you know people are afraid of AIDS. I said, "What? They're going to get AIDS when I'm telling a joke?" It, <laughs> you know. So I looked more and more uh, uh, towards politics, and I still cared a lot about public education. So the AIDS uh, pandemic had sort of really hit the hit the boy town. I'll tell you yeah uh, we did in, in those days it was uh, hello how are you the next day he uh, uh, or week he'd be dead mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the physical decrepitude the uh, Kaposi's you know the purples I mean people going did you hear about Eric he went blind did you hear about so-and-so uh, he lost his leg and the uh, total uh, unpreparedness of the medical community yeah. as well uh, you know I've always learned a lot from previous civil rights issues and you know particularly feminist and the african-american and you know there there was there were models there and how to fight all this uh, and I'll go back to the class issue Diane Feinstein was the mayor at that time Diane's a very proper woman you know and the world is there's a there's a moralistic streak there um, and someday when I write my book you know Harvey and she didn't get along and I have some wild stories about that <laughs> their confrontation you better save some for your book though. yeah better otherwise we're gonna have this downloaded on all YouTube. right well you, you know, know it's so. easier for me to talk than to write but uh, <laughs> and but she did listen to what I call the a gays because AIDS did not discriminate that way and so you know a lot of the fellows and women who had supported her you know who came from upper middle class backgrounds were dying and was and losing their houses and so she actually got it uh, and I will give her credit for that and so she started to fund that's all what we needed is funding to at least start to um, uh, you know look at research and what the hell was this horrible thing mm -hmm. and then there the attendant thing was uh, activism mm -hmm. you know all the 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 what I call the the Bloody Marys they were called the act up and lying in the streets and and not taking it was quite wonderful you know mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you really were fighting for something. You were fighting for your life. Everything, it sounds a little, you know, hokey, but it's absolutely true. No, it actually, I think, you brought know? the women's movement and the gay and the men's gay movement. It's going to go right there. That's right, because uh, when a lot of the guys were sick or not knowing what to do and uh, the horrible family, uh, disp you know, when the family found out, some of these guys didn't even, uh, the family didn't know they were gay. Right. Hello, he's living in San Francisco with his roommate, but they didn't even know that. And then when you got AIDS, they, they couldn't deal with it. They would just disinherit them. And so a lot of our women friends, you know, really stepped up to the plate. It was really, you know, very, very gratifying. And, you know, they had their own grief to deal with, you know, caretakers. Right. I, it was just horrible for them to lose as many friends as they lost as, as well. Um, so that's where my political pulse came from. And so I, I ran for school board in uh, 1979 or something uh -huh. and just got the crap beat out of me about <laughs> it. But um, so in 88, and here we are at the height of the age saying, you know, I'm doing comedy, but I'm getting the message. I'm not going to be on Johnny Carson. <laughs> you know, I think I'm great. My friends think I'm great, but it just ain't translating. Um, so I did a uh, uh, kind of a mock race for mayor, and I had a few issues. One was to name a school after Harvey Milk uh -huh. and something else. Uh, and I, I never had a fundraiser except uh, for a library bond. I dressed up as Pee Wee Herman, and, who I adored, <laughs> as you can imagine. And, uh, and uh, uh, my friend played Miss Yvonne. And I think, you know, I raised $12 and I got 58,000 <laughs> votes. Wow. And that's when, my, you know, my friends and, Eve, and my, my lover, who is still alive then, said, you know, you should take this serious. I said, no, no, I want to be the first gay this. I'm, no, you know, should really take it seriously. And I didn't. And I ran in the 90. And we had what we called the Lavender Sweep. Huh. So uh, Migden won. Roberta Actenberg won. Tom Amiano won for the school board. Uh, a, a good friend of ours, Donna Hitches, won. The uh -huh. first lesbian. Now a mayor. Yeah. I mean, a, a judge. judge. Yeah. Uh, and so that that was my uh, baptism into electoral politics, and I've been involved ever since. Well, been involved ever since is, is another story too, because um, the lavender sweep is all in a way it's kind of the beginning. Yeah. I mean, you know, the city of West Hollywood began as a place where everybody was going to try to get along, and they didn't want to handle their own development or not have it or whatever. Yeah. But it was also a place where gay people felt, you know, comfortable. That's and, the deal. And then day one starts, and now you've got to actually govern. Yeah. So what's it been like for you in the government, Tom? It's been bumpy. Um, the, uh, you know, my particular political bent is is what, for lack of a better word, progressive, not so mainstreamy, you know, lefty, whatever you want to call it. And uh, uh, the the board of education was bumpy first because. You're always single issue, no matter what you do mm -hmm. in the beginning, mm -hmm. particularly because you're catching up. You know, there was no AIDS program in the school district. There was no gay lesbian uh, counseling in this. There was no recognition of gay parents. So I did all that, right. and but it, and even though I had been a teacher, they, well, you know, he's one issue. But then when I started to really make my presence felt, going to meetings, uh, uh, championing other, you know, the the blacks had a big issue with the curriculum, right? As you can can imagine and you know all these uh, Hoyt Mifflin and all those these are like the McDonald's of the education right. world and the textbooks and there was no mention of blacks or if there were and so when I got involved in that I mean I would always lose the vote <laughs> I would never win the vote but you know you keep to to what you believe you know is a consistency uh, uh, so you 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 start to become more than a, the gay guy on the school board uh, even though that will always 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 be with us even now after all these years uh, and that got my feet wet in, in um, other issues in, in an electoral way and so then I ran for the the board of supervisors and 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 one and even there my, you know um, for history's sake many of my gay lesbian colleagues were just not even though they served with me, they were threatened, mm -hmm. you know, because I wanted to push it. Right. And not not to just to make trouble, you know. I kind of no. figure I knew what was to make right. Justice. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, you're always still the odd man out kind of things, you know. But uh, um, it worked out when when we I ran citywide twice, and even with my little lefty bent, my wrist flapping, I uh, came in number one, which made you president of the board. Oh horrors! Oh, there's a president <laughs> of the board. And to show you the inbred homophobia, because people don't even know. You know, a lot of it's what I call heterosexism, too. Mm -hmm. It's not like just homophobic. Um, the outgoing president, she thought she would be funny. You know, she, uh, you know, I don't 
know really what she meant. You come up, there's like a little ceremony. People are weeping. You know, I got a suit on from a, a guy who died of AIDS, and I, you know, that, she gave me a wand and a, and a tiara. And mm -hmm. that, when that's the picture that was on the front page. Now I did not put the tiara on. I did wow. not wave the wand, but uh, that's the picture. And was your partner still alive? Uh, no, he died about five days before I got elected to the board of supervisors. Wow. So you know, what can you do? It was kind of being mocked. And, and stereotyped. I don't think that this particular woman thought that, but you know, spare me that. You know, I'll do that myself. Well, Thank I you mean, very much. coming in first in the voting. Yeah. President of the Board of Supervisors. I mean, it's yeah. you know, it's disrespectful. I, I really do understand. I mean, I was the first one gay elected or lesbian elected to the legislature. You probably got all kinds of remarks. And well. Yes, mostly from the other side of the aisle. Yeah. My colleagues were but very... But mean, but mean, right? Yeah. They yeah. were mean, well, they were mean about the community. It's like, all gay people are spawn of the devil. Yeah. Uh, nothing personal, Sheila. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> yeah. for years. I burned your house down. But you yeah, nothing but it wasn't personal. about you. And you weren't there. I made sure you weren't there at the time. Um, it's, it's, it's not, of course, as bad as it was no. not as bad as it was well sometimes the subtle stuff can, you know that's when you really have to start the work because this layer of oppression gets peeled away and then you see the real stuff and then you get there oh the one i love is oh now they're taking over i wish yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot more involved than just gay stuff and running a city oh yeah so what have you what have you learned what have you sort of what has been the most interesting set of things you've dealt with well I, I thought um, how to use uh, you know what where you were not just for self-serving purposes but to, uh, I like the idea of being the conduit and then you and the community you, you come to me or I'll go to you and that's how we got domestic partners in, in say that we don't give any contracts out uh, and um, I like the, the risk-taking because I figure I can always do something else you know tell a joke at some right. some uh, Jewish convention or some Italian <laughs> wedding, um, and then you learn how it works. Uh, you know, it's not rocket science. You pay attention and you learn how, how government works, uh, your particular government. I really wanted district elections in San Francisco. I had an affectionate nostalgia because that's how Harvey won. That's how the first mm -hmm. openly gay male in San Francisco ever got elected. Uh, but we were doing citywide. It cost too much. So I, I worked to put something on the ballot and we got district elections. Mm -hmm. And that gave then the tools for a more populist form of city government. Mm -hmm. Not perfect. Yeah, and certainly not, you know, not uh, something that uh, always works in, in the way you thought. And uh, so uh, I like that part. I like the populism part. And then you look at what people's needs are, whether they're gay or straight or whatever. And it's, uh, it's housing, it's, it's uh, health, transportation. I, I like transportation. I don't know where that came from, you know, but I, I'm on a couple of regional boards. Must have been all those Greyhound buses. <laughs> the Greyhound buses. You see how everything is exactly. It's all connected. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, so you just take your natural instincts and you try to see what you could do legislatively or go to the ballot with a lot of times the stuff I had proposed uh, didn't make it legislatively because I would be outvoted even by the other gay ones you know mm -hmm. but then I would go to the ballot with, mm -hmm. with stuff and uh, that would win um, or do well you know so uh, there's a comfort zone I have now I'll never stop feeling like an outsider I think that that's unfortunately something that's in my DNA mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime you know why not do the best you can now what about family family. Um, uh, I have uh, an interesting story about that. I have, of course, my Italian family back east, which I'm still very close to, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, in the 70s, uh, I was teaching preschool, and uh, like I said, there was a big feminist movement. And women, especially dykes, if they want to have kids and they were involved with a guy, were really up the creek because if there was any custody question, mm -hmm. anything, you went before a judge, usually a male judge. And and would, would take and the, and right. they would take the kid away from the the dyke mom. Right. So uh, underground things started where you'd have anonym, anonymous donors. Uh -huh. And so a woman who uh, had a kid in my preschool class asked me, uh, would I be interested in being an anonymous donor? I said, first of all, I know you asked Tim first because he's very good looking. <laughs> so I know I'm the second choice. You know, you know. One time I saw in the beginning there was all gay lesbian mothers in the gay parade. You know, sometime in the 70s. And I said, can't you just mix up the donors? All your kids look like Howdy Doody, and you're like Sephardic looking. You know? <laughs> 
So I said I'd do it. And, uh, uh, you know, one night there's this little knock at the door and it's Shoshana, I, you know, she doesn't know who you are. And then uh, you go upstairs and you do the act and you put it in a little jar and then you go, <laughs> goodbye, you know. And that was it. Wow. I thought that, you know, I'll never know anything and that was fine. Didn't really want to be a, a dad. And, uh, and I thought this was going to be helpful. Uh, but about 10 years later, I did get a call and uh, apparently the kid, um, looked a lot like me and not like the mothers, the bio, the bio mom, you know, and was pushing. I don't know where she got that in her personality. Just, but I Talk wanted, about you know, in the DNA. Yes, it, but nature versus pushing nurture. Pushing to know who her father she was. She really wanted to know. She was 10. Mm -hmm. And so they did this backward stepping because, you know, nobody really did know each other. It was really cool. Right. No, it really was anonymous. As it turns out, they lived 10 blocks away, and I kind of knew them. Huh. And some of their girlfriends were going, did you see the Harvey Milk film? If that guy isn't Annie's father, I don't know who it is. I mean, it was so obvious, uh -huh. but not to me. I didn't even know the situation. Uh -huh. So uh, Tim was still alive, and I said, well, you want to be a, a dad? I don't know what the role's going to be. Uh, he said, sure. You know, he, by that time, he was very used to me. And now Did he's doing... mothers uh, contact you? Uh, well, in the, you know, through the first person who asked right, me 10 years before. Then we had a meeting where I met the moms. Uh -huh. And we, you know, we liked each other. And then they kind of laid out what, what they wanted. And <clears throat> a friend of mine who had been adopted and actually looked a lot like uh, her birth father, she, uh, but not at all like the rest of her Latin family. It was uh -huh. interesting, the parallels. Uh -huh. I need to meet him. I need to meet him. She said, I finally met him. That's all I wanted. Right. And he wanted a little more, and it got a little more. So she gave me the heads up. If you if you think you're going to want more, remember this. You don't know what the kid will want. Right. And actually, Annie was very conflicted. I mean, she was a doll, you know, and the, the, the situation was great uh, for her. Uh, but she was conflicted. Sure. I, I did take her back to the Italian family. She loved that identity. Uh -huh. She just, it was something she had never seen before. Working class Italian, blue collar people, <laughs> screaming, yelling, having orange carpets and gilded wallpaper and she just <laughs> and they loved her immediately they I don't know if they ever fit I think my older sister still says oh yeah Tommy and, and Dion got drunk one night and this and Dion and I look at you know we don't think so just the idea of it <laughs> and so it's grown since then you know Annie uh, lived through Tim's death which was very hard for her she was 15 at the time uh -huh. um, uh, so we've gotten closer. It's a very nice feeling. I'm very proud of her. She's a very, very strong young woman. Uh, went into teaching. Uh, she has a partner, uh, a male partner, uh, and they have two children. So I'm a, a, gay, a gay grandfather, big queen grandfather. Wonderful. Yeah, it's good. It's really good. And I, who'd have thunk it? I mean, literally. But who'd Tom, have thunk the knock it? comes on the door. <laughs> you don't know you have a kid. Now you suddenly have a kid. I, oh, how did you? It, well, it, it was odd. I was a little worried about it. I wasn't quite sure because, you know, I remember the Chinatown movie, You're My Donor, You're My Father, You're My Donor. Right. But it was also the milieu of San Francisco. And now that it was out that, uh, you know, I was the, the bio dad and all that, then you you pay more attention to when you see people and, and, and who you see. And uh, her mom and uh, the partner are, are very much involved in lefty politics. Uh -huh. So, you know, you'd be at the same events um, and people would know and they think it was darling, you know. <laughs> it wasn't always darling. It was hard, you know. Sure. And, uh, Parenting be, is not, I mean, even no, if it comes late to but, you. Yeah. And, you know, I, I didn't do any hard work. You know, I didn't birth the kid. And I certainly wasn't there for the really hard child rearing part, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was a little, a little intimidating from time to time, um, but there was a natural part. I think you know, if you, uh, I think it's the Italian family thing. All right, I don't know who you are, or where you came from, but you're in the family now. <laughs> right. So that was comfortable, um, and so. I'd say the outcome of this particular story is, is good because, um, you know, I always give caveats to my friends who think, well, I, I'll, I'll have a child, uh, you know, with this gay guy or I'll have a child with this, with this lesbian couple. And it'll be very, 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 you, you think it's copacetic, but mm -hmm. there's, you know. Well, real not, people are involved. Yeah. And then there's the children. And it could be, and it could be very uh, right. adverse situation. So you really want, I lucked out. You know, I liked being the anonymous donor, and then when there was disclosure, I thought, why not? You know, but uh, I don't, uh, you know, I think I'm more the gay uncle 
mm -hmm. than the father, although it is a trip when you see a kid that you didn't know was around or, or never saw you have the same kind of manner. It's everything that's negative is me. The overbite is me. <laughs> the mood swings are me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good now there's somebody to blame, blame it on. Well, that's right. a, I exactly. don't mind that either. So, so um, it, 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 it's, a, it's an interesting life, Tom. It's like you... Mm -hmm. You follow passions, but you you don't, you don't really know where they're going to lead. Usually not. I mean, no. talk about risk taking. Yeah. But it's a but it's a good thing. It seems to me. At it least feels it sounds like it's been good. It feels fulfilling. And I was trying to one day I was trying to think about what what the what the deal is with me, and I think there's something that uh, I, you know I get off on on being like the first or the or a pioneer, or, you know, wherever that came from. When I was eight years old in, in New Jersey, we lived next door to a gas station, and I would look out the window, and those days um, uh, cowboys were in. Everything was cowboys. Uh, and I thought, I'm going to be a cowboy, and I'm going to move out west, and I'm going to find me a cowboy friend. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, actually I did. Tim was from Texas <laughs> in San Francisco. I've never known dreams yet, come true. Yeah. Uh, so there was it's always that thing, uh, I think escape, you know, and then as long as you're escaping, you might as well do something, you know, mm -hmm. and have fun with it, mm -hmm. you know. Family so, taught me a great sense of humor. What do you see, what do you see yourself doing next? I mean, I know at this moment in time, though, I never know when the shows will be yeah. shown, you know, especially years from now, but at this moment in time, you're running for the State Assembly yeah. in California. Yeah, and um, I like that a lot. The reason is, because people say, geez, aren't you fed up with this stuff? And yeah, I'm, 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 I am getting tired of doing retail, what we call retail. Yeah. Yeah, you got your stop sign. Yeah, I know it's on the wrong side of the street. I'm so sorry. You know, and I like the city policy. You know, we did universal health care. We did the domestic partners. And, and now I'm doing this, you know, municipal ID for uh, 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 undocumented people. I like all that, being able to do that. Um, but I like what's happening in the state on, uh, and, and the kind of stuff that you do particularly. And, and Carol and Mark and, and John and, and Sheila, uh, you're showing what we just talked about. Yeah, yeah, I got the queer agenda. That's right. And I'm not going to apologize for that in terms of social justice. But I do like transportation, and I do have a brain. And, you know, I know how things work. And uh, I don't mind losing. You well, know, I don't, you don't really lose, but you do lose a vote. But well, we don't, it's, you know. it's interesting. I yeah. mean, sometimes people are just oppositional. And I notice that they don't, which is not you, uh, they don't care. It's almost like they identify themselves yeah, by, by saying, you know, see, I lost again. I told you. I could have told you what happened. Yeah, yeah. But you'll be very effective there, I can tell you, because well, so, all you yeah. have to do is, you know, have an idea, think about it, always tell the truth, keep your promises. You know, it's like that book that guy wrote that says, everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. It's true. It's huh? actually not it's because there. we're like kindergarten in yeah. the state legislature, but because those are the basic things that you need and that, you know, that make you successful. And the canvas is huge. I know. See, I like that part. Yeah. yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. California has 37 million people in it. Amazing. It's like we're bigger than half the countries in the world. And you really actually do get to make laws. And you've you know? been very encouraging, too, about the, the, when you go there with some government experience, it's, it's very user friendly towards you as opposed to, I guess that's the term limit <clears throat> downside, you know, where you're gone. Uh, right. And so but, people or people but get elected. Bringing experience with you is very good. Yeah. So, so. that um, so that's it. Why public service, though? I mean, it's, it's sort yeah. of interesting. Don't you called know. it politics. I think um, I could have been a, like a worker priest or something too. Yeah. If things hadn't been. Di I like liberation theology. I'll go back to the, the you know, and in, in all these organized religions, obviously there was some seed of, you know, before things got a little too twisted. Uh, some seed of service or, or whatever, and I probably like that. Uh, you know, you, by taking care of other people, you're taking care of yourself, you know, all that kind of stuff. And certainly, uh, the, the playground for me was, and a lot of us, was very brutal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe doing other things, you know, got the opportunity to see how, uh, you know, maybe this service worked or, or, or what have you. And you actually, somebody said to you, oh, good, you did good. We're out in the playground. That would not happen. You couldn't play ball. You know, you wanted to be with the girls, which I thought was probably the smartest thing I ever did. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you got a little approbation. 
uh, mm -hmm. from doing that. And uh, uh, and then I think if you 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 follow what you learn in kindergarten, there's also you, a sense of being different. That I mean, not everyone has that sense, obviously. Yeah, but yeah. I think you mentioned to me you were an eye patch at one time. Yeah, very good. You have a great memory. That's right. And I didn't think of it till I talked to you. So um, it made me really different. Uh, aside from being a little Nelly thing, I mean, phys and I wore the damn thing from. Uh, I think the first grade to the fifth grade. Why? Um, I had strabismus. I was very, very cross-eyed. Huh. And this was a charity care case. And surgery wasn't big in the 40s. And so uh, actually this, it was great because it did correct it without surgery. But the psychological stuff was, was really bad. You know, and if either people were over and, and think that was only an eye patch. Imagine if you had like a, a real dis or a disfigurement. Right. Boy. So, it was the first thing that people noticed. So they didn't notice me, it was the first thing people noticed. And I, I think I, when I first came to California, I didn't have the eye patch on, but I think I had it inside because, uh, you know, uh, uh, so New York, you know, and so skinny and my voice is high. Uh, the whole first year in, in San Francisco, I thought nobody was listening to me. They were just like, what is this? <laughs> You know? <laughs> uh -huh. Well, and it's interesting, too, because the camp that you counseled at, I mean, I'm just thinking of the issue of difference, because I, I, obviously it's been a theme yeah. in both of our lives. Yeah. And it's not only gayness. It's no. something, there are other issues as yeah. well. Yeah. But I think it leads to a kind of empathy. I, I don't know. Maybe I like empathy it. is there, and then that leads to yeah, it. You but, know, it could be chicken and egg. I don't know. But it's satisfying, you know, and you do feel fulfilled. Um, and I, oh, you know, whatever it is, ADD plus whatever, you know, I'm, I'm always restless and can't sit still. And uh, some, you know, getting older, a couple of friends have saying, you know, is it, is Amiano slowing down? <laughs> and they go, well, maybe compared to the 20s. I think it's something yeah. in the water in San Francisco yes. because virtually every ADD <laughs> member of the legislature has come from San Francisco. Don't you think, though, that it's a it's a it's a gift for a politician? <laughs> In a know, way, it is. Guess, it just yeah. depends. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. you have to sit down sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, the special ed part, you know, where you work with the de de developmentally disabled, you, it takes a certain kind of patience. But I didn't even know I had, uh -huh. and I think I used to, uh, used to blow uh, Tim away. That you know you could work so painstakingly, and then at the same time go, "Where's my shirt? Where's the garbage? I can't find the thing. Oh my God!" <laughs> you know. Um, so anyway, I've been lucky. I really, really feel like a very, very lucky, lucky, lucky guy, you know? And, uh, you know, part of that was, you know, that homing pigeon instinct of finding a place like San Francisco, which is mm -hmm. far from perfect and has, still has a lot of residual homos homophobia and all, all the things. But there, I think it was opportunity and that culture part. You could really develop who you were. And it, and, and it wasn't a drawback to be queer, it actually en enriched you. Maybe and nobody else saw that, but you saw that. And then making friends, I always say that, you know, if I can say this on TV, when I was in my 20s and I came to San Francisco and entered the gay scene, man, getting laid was so wonderful. Oh, he, all the repression in New Jersey and the all boys schools and the furtive and the secretive and the discovery. Uh, but the best thing was friends, the mm -hmm. best thing that they were gay and you had real friends and then the straight friends who came along and didn't care that you were gay I, I always felt that that was the gift and that was not in my life and probably not in yours you know from New Jersey or wherever we were from so it's really well, I mean, really it was wonderful it kind of the same for me when I first got elected I didn't know what to expect up there because it was like you know, I'm Here the only is. one, what yeah. is it going to be like? And right away we had a caucus of the Democratic members uh, because it was kind of a crisis when we got there because we had lost a lot of seats and it was a perfectly evenly divided assembly in California. 40 Democrats and 40 Republicans and everything was in crisis and I didn't know what and I walked into the Democratic caucus and immediately John Burton from San Francisco, Came right over I don't you. have to explain but to you but yeah. you know to them and uh, one of our African-American members and Antonio Villaraigosa who's now mayor of Los wow. Angeles. Wow. You know so it was like a rainbow coalition yeah. of people, 10 people comes over yeah. to me and says okay so we don't want you to have to eat lunch by yourself so we're the honorary gay lesbian caucus. <laughs> so wonderful. <laughs> and I thought, phew, yeah. you know. Yeah, thank God. And yeah. things have changed so much really for our community and the world. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I think that um, um, going back to the mechanics of it, that the term limit issue has probably put a, 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 a a little bit of an obstacle for everybody mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know what's going to happen with that, 
You know, well, but we'll I, do our best. I don't either. You know, we'll do but our I best. But I mean, you know, thinking about our community and the the, the institutional the, memory the, being part. able to come out, being able to get elected. I mean, it's been a very short amount of time for us. Very fair. Growing pains. I think we've had. You know, we really made. A, a lot of progress in a short time and I think just like a, a kid if your bones grow fast you know you're gonna have some uh, yeah, uh, problems growing pains growing pains you right. know exactly what is the right thing to do um, I'm not a big uh, uh, fan of assimilation not that I don't want the playing field leveled and everything but I, I want that difference you're talking about sure. I want that to be maintained and I'm seeing a drift away from it and you know I try to be like you know the old guy saying be careful be careful it's fine to be a little this and a little that, you know, but I want you to own your house. And if you want to have kids, God love you, have kids. But don't forget, you know, we're not the same. And that's good. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I guess, the, back to that cultural thing. It is. You know, so one last question, because I think we're down to the last two or three minutes. Unbelievable. Believe it or not. I know. Yeah. I love talking to you. And I did really this without a beer, fun. folks. You know, you <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I haven't had a beer for 30 years. Yeah, so. all right. You can drink All it, made up for you. Yeah. Exactly. Um, what sort of what would you like to be your legacy I guess let's say you serve up there whatever the terms are going to be you yeah. know I always thought on the gravestone I'd like to say here stands Tom Amiano um, <laughs> I you know the, the leg I, I have to say and, and not, not to d diminish uh, the question because it's a good one you, you, when you get to a certain point in life and especially politics all of a sudden it, and especially guys so it's legacy you know it becomes like a th what's your leg I don't know you know uh, uh, Willie Brown well, he wants he's not going to rest until he has this leg legacy, a building name after him, or, I don't mean or that. what I have you. Mean, yeah. What was the good thing you did when you were there? I, I think basically that coming out in in certain venues that were uh, very hostile, not not necessarily nurturing, nourishing, and just holding my uh, holding my ground. And you do that with a lot of support too. But you know, sometimes you don't. It's not visible. But you know, you took something from this person, or took, and uh, you have internalized it. So I, I'd say that kind of populist, th that would be fine with me, you know. So that sounds good to me too, Tom. All right, that, no so punchline. I have no punchline. I don't think. Well, you know, I I always try to think of a punchline myself. But I think the. I mean, for us, it's just uh, it's been it's been a good life thanks to other people and thanks to Absolutely. opportunity and the ability to just actually live in a time where. You could say you were gay or lesbian, somebody would vote for you. Yeah. You know, now it probably still an awful lot of places where that's not the case. No, I know that. And uh, and um, I'm hoping that, you know, w when that's finally eradicated, uh, other things that are like that will be eradicated too. I think one thing Milk has said, and I've heard you say, is, you know, w when we make these little advances that we make and we get this, don't forget about somebody else who's in the back of the bus, which is the prime example of the transsexual issue right That's now. That's right, exactly. You know, we're dysfunctional, the LGBT, God knows we are, but we, we are this, this dysfunctional extended family, and it, these family members are not going to be left behind, you know. Uh, I'm sorry that the Beltway thinking isn't that, you know, but we'll change it. We will change yeah, it. Yeah. Tom, thank you so much thank for you. being with us. Thank you for being with us. And uh, next time you think about the next thing you want to do in your life, uh, just go for it, because whatever it is, you'll get used to it.